Hell tries to bring down Russell Crowe's legendary outlaw in 310 to Yuma. I'm Richard Roper, filling in for Roger this week. Once again, Robert Wolanski, welcome back, sir. Thanks, it's good to be here. I enjoy continuing our on-camera love affair. Okay, Russell Crowe and Christian Bale are two of the finest actors of their generation, and their talents are put to great use in our first movie, 310 to Yuma. It opens next week, but this is an early review. This is a violent and gritty update of the Glenn Ford Van Heflin favorite from the 50s. Now, sometimes when the bullets fly, logic flies out the window with them, but this is a triumph of style and action and codes of honor among men, even if one of those men is a glorified serial killer. Well, would you look at all this? You all spared no expense this time, Byron. I gotta say, though, it's probably cheaper just to let me rob the damn thing. Crow's portrayal of Ben Wade is another in a long line of great performances from Crow. Wade's a stone-cold killer, but he's also a charismatic leader with a dark sense of humor and a keen eye for the ladies. <laughs> I feel skinny. That's all right. I don't mind skinny girls. As long as they got green eyes to make up for it. Now, Christian Bale has to be the most masochistic actor in modern movie history. He takes on another punishing role here as Dan Evans. He's a rancher who lost a leg in the Civil War and has lost face with the townsfolk and with his family. He tries to redeem himself by bringing Ben Wade to justice. Ben Wade has a gang, and they're out there tonight, somewhere. If I don't go, we gotta pack up and leave. Now I'm tired, Alice. I'm tired of watching my boys go hungry. Now, by the time Evans gets weighed near that train station for the 310 to Yuma, where there's a federal court, the two have formed an alliance of sorts. What time is it? About 10 past 3. Where's the 310 to Yuma? I'm running late, I suppose. Goddamn train. Never can rely on them, huh? Director James Mangold and his crew have created a worthy successor to a minor classic. The cinematography here is gorgeous when it needs to be. The action is rough and crowd-pleasing. The performances are just stellar. It's a hell of an entertaining Western, Robert. You know, I dig it. It suffers from the one problem that most modern-day Westerns seem to suffer from, which is that they're very talky. The idea that the modern-day Western needs to be more psychological. You need to understand the motivations for who mm. these characters are and what they do. That seems to have really come about, I think, after Unforgiven has really sort of infected the modern Western. Uh, I know what you're saying, but it, and it is talky, but the dialogue here, I think, is so good. You know, Peter Fonda has a nice turn here, and a lot of the exchanges right. are so sharp are some great that I found it entertaining, because you're right, there, there are moments where you're like, okay, you know, talk, 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 talk. It is 30 minutes but, longer than the original. Yeah, well, you know what? They're, they're always going to be longer. It's kind of interesting, too, the original based on a a short story by uh, uh, an up-and-coming young writer named Elmore Leonard and you know a half century later to see that material used to, to, to good effect once again but you also have I mean I like Glenn Ford and Van Heflin but they were kind of in the second tier of actors and with Russell Crowe and Christian Bale you're talking about as good as it gets I think there was something about seeing though Glenn Ford in that original film where he sort of reversed this image that we had of him and he was yeah, so great at yeah, that. yeah. And, I do, and I do like this a lot in fact I think it's really a great film regardless of genre. Mm -hmm. I, I do have a problem, as I did with the original, the ending makes absolutely no sense. Well, that, that's the thing, you know, you, you get these two guys sort of bonding and you can understand why this Ben Wade killer character would have some empathy for the rancher and kind of respect him, but I don't know if the respect would go as far as it does in this film. It's but, pity that but, turns to respect inexplicably in a moment of, in a blink of an eye. Yeah, in a almost, hotel room. all of a sudden they're almost Butch and Sundance, but they're not. And it is, I mean, it really about it is, funny. It's and, and there are some like great, that. great, you know, fight, you know, shooting scenes here. And the good old, you know, they always get whiskey in the middle of the day because they could drink back then. They go into the tavern, you have the obligatory hot babe who's just waiting around. All that stuff, right. very well done. I will say the best thing about it is that it finally found out how to use Luke Wilson in 30 second when increments the hell's going on? in a role that lasts no longer than two minutes. Hey, you know, I forgot he was in here, but he's actually very good in there. <laughs> right, exactly. Well, our next movie is aptly named, if nothing else, from director James Wan, <laughs> maker of the gore porn saw, comes Death Sentence, a stock revenge thriller in which a furious father guns for the gang bangers who offed his kid and threatened his family. Kevin Bacon is far from footloose as Nick Hume. And he and his wife, played by Kelly Preston, have two boys. The eldest is a hockey stud, the youngest is a painter. One night, Nick and the oldest stop for a gas in a bad part of town, and the kid's gutted by a gang member. Only Nick refuses to testify against the killer because the DA wants to cut a deal for a shorter sentence. I want this guy to go away for the rest of his life. I've got one eyewitness, you. We've just got your word. 
I'm dismissing this case. Mr. Darley, you are released from custody. Instead, Nick takes it upon himself to exact justice. Only an eye for an eye leads to a leg and an arm and a head as Nick unleashes a gang war that threatens to destroy the entire Hume household. Just try to get through tonight, Mr. Hume. And be grateful you're still alive. But if you started a war, God help you. That's Aisha Tyler as the cop who does little more than scold and lecture Nick in a movie that depicts the police as do-nothing bystanders who allow Nick and the bad guys free reign of the city. Between the breathy mood music and the death wish ripoffs, I couldn't tell if this was parody or homage. But I laughed more during Death Sentence than The Nanny Diaries, and that cannot be a good sign. Well, you mentioned Death Wish, and I guess uh, the one of the co-writers here did some of the source material right. for the original Death Wish. It's that movie. Maybe if you looked at it as a Western, a modern Western, we just talked about a great Western, well, it might work. But you know what? I, I'm not, I'm not going to make excuses for this movie. It's terrible, and it's so disappointing because I, I love Kevin Bacon, and I love Aisha, and you have good actors here who are trapped. In, you know, this is the kind of movie, Robert, where there was this one extended shootout sequence where I kept thinking, this has got to be a dream. This has to be a dream because it's so ridiculous. The home invasion I'm talking right. about. It's so insane and so over the top. I'm thinking, okay, he's gonna, we're going to get that scene where he wakes up in the middle no, of the wait, night. That was, a, but it, it was preceded by the whole parking garage sequence that is, that's out of Die Hard. Beyond, but, but you know what? Don't even mention Die Hard. Don't even you know compare any oh, movie to this thing. I'm telling you, this thing is so bad. It's, it's a huge disappointment because I thought, well, at least with the cast, that this is going to have something, something of merit to it, and it's just terrible. That's what you get for getting your hopes up. Well, they're down now. Later in the show, Richard Gere searches for a war criminal in the hunting party. And next, Christopher Walken stars in Balls of Fury. Oh, come on! You got me hitting balls with spoons? I'm swatting flies now? You will not hit flies. You hit bees. What? Next up, Balls of Fury. Now, here's proof that taking a fringe sport and giving it the Will Ferrell treatment doesn't guarantee a film will be funny or even <laughs> mediocre. This movie is deadly, it's cheap looking, it's poorly made with scenes that go nowhere and gags that would have seemed dated around the time of Airplane 2. Dan Fogler, who's like Jack Black with all the talent sucked out, hams his way through a clunky performance as Randy Daytona, a former ping pong whiz kid. Have your grandma pull the car around. The great Christopher Walken, who would probably star in your straight to YouTube home video if you asked him and you had 10 bucks, has one of the more ridiculous roles in a career filled with bizarre choices. You killed him. Well, duh. What part of sudden death didn't you understand? Balls of Fury has the look and the feel of a movie that should have premiered on a triple-digit cable channel about 2 in the morning. The biggest disappointment, I guess, for me was Maggie Q. She's wasted here. She was the best thing in Live Free or Die Hard. She deserves better. Here's hoping everyone connected with Balls of Fury has something better to work with next time out. I hated this movie. Yeah, I'm not that big a fan either, but you know, Dan Fogler doesn't remind me of Jack Black so much as he reminds me of a young Curtis Armstrong, Booger, Booger from, Revenge from Revenge of the Nerds. Of the Nerds. Okay. He's got that kind of thing He's going. He's a doughier and, Booger. And the idea so of putting speak. Booger in a movie called Balls of Fury, yeah. while I like the idea, it doesn't necessarily get me going. What I find really aggravating about this film, it's a parody of a parody. You get yeah. Hoosiers, say, or you get any great sports movie, then you get dodgeball or you get these movies that parody yeah. those now what is this the yeah. second sort of xerox the pale imitation of what was kind of just a pale imitation it's almost as with? if they were going through like you know the espn 9 catalog of sports that haven't been lampooned in will ferrell movies so they said ping pong that'll be it and we'll make it we'll do a wacky double entendre title and and then we'll just make a movie and it's like but you forgot about the movie part the movie exists yeah. simply so people like us can say the title over and over again and try to pretend like we're not making silly jokes about it when that's all we really want to do well, there, there you have it. So uh, enough uh, balls of fury for us. Coming up next, Richard Gere has his eye on vengeance in the hunting party. No, he's hiding. Heads up, lady. Try smiling once in a while. People hate you. <gasps> Looking at movies now in theaters, Scarlett Johansson bombs in The Nanny Diaries, Josh Hartnett bores in Resurrecting the Champ, but we love The King of Kong, a great documentary. One of my favorite movies of the year. 
Mine too. Next up is a movie I also like a great deal. It's the latest from Richard Shepard, maker of The Mighty Matador a couple of years yes, back. Yes, yes. It's called The Hunting Party. It opens next week, and this is an early review. <sighs> This is Shepard's latest foray into male bonding, starring Richard Gere Simon, a network news correspondent who lost his mind somewhere in Bosnia in the mid-1990s. Terrence Howard is his cameraman, nicknamed Duck, called back from his cushy New York gig to help Simon find a Serbian war criminal allegedly hiding in the woods. Duck thinks Simon just wants an interview. Simon, it turns out, wants a whole lot more. He's expecting NATO troops, not two jerks in a car. Have you thought about the bodyguards that he travels with, Simon? Yeah, and where does he's got uh, 20 armed guards with him at all times? Yeah, well, I heard it's 50. 50? 50. <laughs> Maybe. Actually, some people believe he has none. Stupid people. Tagging along is a network yes. vice president's kid played by Squid in the Whale's Jesse Eisenberg. Mm. And amazingly, all three are pegged by a UN soldier named Boris as CIA operatives. Go to Chilambici. Do the world a favor. Okay, I'm sorry, are you still insinuating we're a CIA hit squad or something? I'm sorry, are you still insinuating you're journalists? Eventually, the trio are brought to a you woman named Mariana, played by Diane Kruger, who says she knows where their prey is hiding. Hmm. Now you give me a thousand marks. A thousand? <laughs> How do you mind? No, I want goodwill gesture. My goodwill has disappeared, lady. I risk everything talking to you. Based on an Esquire article about five journalists, among them the Perfect Storms author Sebastian Junger, drunk enough to attempt such a stunt, the hunting party further explores Richard Shepard's interest in how men show each other, you know, something resembling love. Like many of the best movies about war and its lingering echo from Mass to Three Kings to No Man's Land, the hunting party is full of dark, choke on them laughs. These are average men in search of a monster, and still they manage to have a pretty damn good time. Just like I did. I couldn't agree with you more, Robert. I mean, a hell of a good time. Very strange that you can, they can pull this off. You mentioned Three Kings. I was even reminded of a film called Salvador with James Woods, where you have that combination of uh, right. dark humor in a real serious subject. I think maybe this is the best way to approach this, because we've seen so many serious films about the consequences of war and journalists covering war, and they get burned out and all those themes. To do it this way in this sort of strange, breezy style, and yet to be able to pull it off without being disrespectful, is no mean feat, and they pull it off here at, at every step, I thought. I think it's always problematic for movies about war correspondents because they tend to romanticize yeah. a sort of exploitive and, and really sort of suicidal gig. Yeah. Yeah. And it really comes off quite well here because yeah. really this is based on an article in which five guys got drunk and decided to take some time off their vacation to go look for a war criminal. But even that approach, you know, the, the idea that it's based on this story, right. they, I mean, they, they have a lot of fun with that in the opening segment right. and then the closing credits are fantastic where they explain what's real and what's not quite real. You, know, you always get those codas telling right. us, well, this happened to this person and this guy was never found. And they do it here in a way that's just brilliant. What's amazing is that yeah. Richard Shepard, before The Matador, people never thought much of his movies because there were things like the Linguini incident and Oxygen, just these forgettable movies that show up on cable every now and then. Yeah. With The Matador, he seems to have really found his voice as someone who makes really powerful and really two good, funny movies. Two good films in a row for him and two good performances from Richard Gere this year because I liked him in The Hoax as well, which was sort of based on a true story, right. but, you know, had some fun with the facts and fiction there. So there I you have it. Good stuff. Next is Dedication, a film that subjects us to one of the more irritating and unlikable leading men in recent romantic comedy history. Billy Crudup does find work as Henry, a children's book author with OCD and many other problems. But it's one thing for a guy to be an abrasive bundle of neurotic problems. It's another thing for a guy to be downright mean and apparently psychotic. Mandy Moore plays Lucy, the illustrator chosen to succeed Henry's late longtime partner. I give to him this, the International on the off chance I'm ever imprisoned and tortured for my political beliefs. Paradoxically, I have no political beliefs. I have a towel I can't throw out because it may have feelings. Though by any standard, you're a nice person. I deeply resent having to work with you. I now that's well written and kind of funny, but other comedic scenes fall flat. Henry's defense mechanism is to lash out with sarcasm and insults. When Lucy finally calls him on this, we can only say amen. We've got work to do, and I ask you if anything inspires you, and you start going on about you and your dopey boyfriend at the beach. You know what? You don't always have to say the first smart-ass thing that pops in your head, Henry. I know this probably means nothing to you, but it's really unattractive. It just makes you look weak and fearful, not clever. 
Even it's when Henry's off. on his best behavior, he's such a self-consumed <laughs> jerk that we can't imagine what Lucy sees in him. Directed by actor Justin Thoreau, dedication has a lot of indie cred elements, from the hipster soundtrack to the quirky characters to the dark humor. What it doesn't have is authenticity. The publishing timeline seems all screwed up. We don't believe for a second Henry would have a knack for children's books that's not ironic or funny. The romance and the breakup are forced, and the final scene in a bookstore bathroom is overblown, so I guess I'm saying I cannot recommend this movie. Really? That's a surprise because it sounded like you absolutely loved it. <laughs> you know, I'm reminded of a recent Entourage episode where Eric is talking to Anna Ferris in the car. She's about to go read for a screenplay. Mm -hmm. And he says to her, she asks him, what do you think of it? And she he goes, oh, you know, if it had just tried to be a regular romantic comedy, it would have been all mm -hmm. right. But it's too artsy. It's too yeah. much beyond what it's capable of being. Well, yeah. that's what dedication is. Yeah. It's your yeah. average, everyday romantic comedy. But it tries to be so much more, it yeah. utterly fails. So look at this guy. Oh, he has to put heavy objects on his chest because he feels the weight of the world and all these little things. Let's just talk more about Entourage, actually, instead yeah, than, this, can we do that? than this movie. It's just, it's forgettable. I think Billy Crudup's a really good actor who's made some interesting choices in his career. Well, and mean, Mandy Moore is, is another one who, you know, she's trying to get out of that pop star thing. She's doing a lot of movies. I think she needs some help in choosing scripts, though, I'd have to say. At this Maybe point. Eric from Entourage. That would be That perfect. would be a good choice. Yes. Let's move to something else, shall oh, we? All right, sir. Crawling into theaters two years after its debut on a film festival circuit that still hasn't forgiven it, <laughs> self-medicated is writer, director, producer, star Monty Lapica's Yeah, Sure, Right, True Life tale about a drug and drinking habit that landed him in a rehab that was more like a prison. Now turn around and bend over. What? I have to make sure you're not hiding anything. Now bend over and cough hard once, please. Yeah, right. No chance. Andrew. We can do this easy way or the hard way, okay? It's up to you. I actually took a drink every time I noticed that the actor, director, writer, producer, star, who's supposed to be 17, <laughs> looks closer to 37. <laughs> then I took a drink whenever he mentioned his dead dad and argued with his pill-popping mom. I was very drunk after this. And sure, it all might have happened, but the result is so much underlit whining. Mm. Self-medicated is self-pitying, self-aggrandizing, and self-loathing. I loved it. Yeah, it's brutal stuff. I hated it. And I think this guy's uh, fatal mistake was casting himself, Among for others. one thing, because he's a bad actor. And I also cracked up because you have all these teenage kids who live in Vegas. And you know that scene in the small town where the kid always says, I got to get out of this right. town. He, they say in Vegas, the guy goes, man, I got to get out of here. I'm like, you're in Vegas, dude. What do you mean you have to get out of Vegas? That's the whole point. If there's yeah. any town in which you should be drinking and boozing it up, it <laughs> yeah. should be Vegas. Well, I got to get out of this dead town, this deadly Vegas. Right. It's just, you got to get out of the deadly it's movie. horrible stuff. Coming up next, Steve Carell stars in our video segment. So you're okay? Indubitably. But first, here's a look at what's coming up on next week's show. You want to buy bullets with food stamps? It's as good as cash. <laughs> We're not expected to fill this whole thing. Just do whatever you can. Good. That kind of a big morning. This week's video segment is brought to you by Raisinets. Make a deliciously smart choice with Raisinets. If someone gives you 10,000 to 1 on anything, you take it. If John Mellencamp ever wins an Oscar, I am going to be a very rich dude. Let's do it. That's a Drop typically that hilarious scene from The Office Season 3. It's my video pick this week, Robert. A, because it's really, really good stuff, and B, there's not a whole lot coming out in terms of theatrical films on DVD. So, check out The Office. There actually is a good movie coming out, by the way, this okay. week on DVD. After body surfing the film festival circuit for about a year, Air Guitar Nation finally lands on video. And if there's a doc as good or as much fun as the King of Kong out there, this is it. Ostensibly about America's, if not the world's, recent obsession with being a faux rock star, Era Guitar Nation is really about two dudes vying for the title, C. Diddy and Bjorn to Rock. Yeah! Best thing about its delayed arrival on DVD, the Where Are They Now extras and the extra performances because this sucker rocks. <laughs> All right, Air Guitar Nation available now. The Office Season 3 will be in stores on Tuesday. And we'll be back to recap this week's show right after this. Close captioning for Ebert and Roper is sponsored by... Man has evolved to the point where he no longer needs to stand in line for tickets. The Movie Tickets card available only at movietickets.com. Guests of Ebert and Roper stay at the Peninsula Chicago, the city's most exciting luxury hotel, located in the heart of Chicago's magnificent mile. 
Okay, recapping the movies on this week's show, two movies to look forward to, 310 to Yuma and The Hunting Party. As for the movies opening right now, not so much. <laughs> so, Robert, some good stuff here, mostly coming out next week. Right, exactly. <laughs> so, so get to the theaters and just wait for them, I guess. Right, just camp out. Yeah, so, hey. there you go. All right, that's it for this week's show. Until next week, the balcony is closed. We know your dirty little secret, your mop. Get to know the cleaner way to clean with the Libman Wonder Mop. The mop head is machine washable, only from Libman. Net Zero gives you the fastest surfing available over dial-up and virus protection, starting at $9.95. Try it risk-free for 30 days with our money-back guarantee. A leather blend sofa for just $2.99. That's unheard of. Just $2.99. That's Jennifer Convertibles. How well is your child mastering the basics? Discover Kumon and let your child amaze you.